So I will start now. Hello and welcome to today UCL Nutrition uh, Programs Open Day. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Emiliana Di Donna, I'm the event officer for the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and I will be your chair for today's session. We hope this session will address those course specific questions you might have, and we help you to gain an insight into what it's really like to study on one of our four master's program. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website for the event. So I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, Prof. Nathan Davis, Dr. Afi Prepada, Dr. Natasha Kalea, and Dr. Erika Cini. So our panelists will present each of our um, master nutrition course and will answer to your question during the Q&A session. So please use the Q&A function to add your question. If your question is to a specific member of our panel, please indicate it in your question. But before we hand it over to Nathan, I just want to share a quick poll. So if you can just let us know which course you are interested in applying for, the options are clinical and public health nutrition, dietetics, obesity and clinical nutrition, eating disorder and clinical nutrition. If you're not sure yet, just select not sure. So I will share the poll just now. You should be able to vote now. I'll give you a minute or so. Okay. So for voting, we have 25%, actually 24% clinical and public health nutrition. 52% of you are interested in dietetics. 8% is um, interested in obesity, and clinical nutrition, 16% in eating disorders and clinical nutrition. I will end the poll now and and now over to you, Nathan. Well, thank you very much and welcome everybody. A very warm welcome to this online uh, discussion this afternoon. We're going to give you a brief rundown of the programs and then hopefully answer any questions that you might uh, might have for us. So I can pop share my screen. And let's just hope that is working for everybody. Okay, you, someone just let me know that's come through, okay? Yep, great. Fantastic. So again, welcome. Um, we have a a lot of speakers today. So my name is Nathan Davis. I'm a professor of biochemistry. I'm also head of education for the Division of Medicine, and I'm a registered nutritionist. Um, as you can see, my colleagues who will also be presenting today, uh, Dr. Papada, uh, will be talking about uh, dietetics. Dr. Kalia will talk about obesity and clinical nutrition. And then we've got Professor Robinson and Dr. Cheney, who will talk about eating disorders uh, before we get to the Q&A. So I suppose one of the big questions should be, why should you consider coming to UCL? Well, what I would say is that UCL is a fantastic place to study. It's a wonderful university. Its location is unparalleled. And uh, I think, you know, our students have a great time when they're with us. And it's been recognized because we are, of course, the good university guide from the Sunday Times and the Times for 2024. Uh, so this is a major achievement. We're very proud of it. And, uh, and I think you actually recognize you know, all the effort that we go into making this uh, a wonderful place for our students. We've got lots more things to talk about. We are consistently rated in the top 10 um, in the universities in the world. We are pretty much there all the time. We also rank very highly for the impact of our scientific work, our scientific papers. We're ranked as the third in the world this year. 
We've got very good academic student ratio, so there's plenty of staff around if you want to, to talk to us, to ask questions, to engage. Um, we do very well in research funding. We pull in lots of money. Uh, we've just re-entered Europe. You may know this. We've just re-entered the Horizon uh, European scheme. And prior to the point where the UK universities didn't participate, we were the best performing uh, university in terms of attracting funding. Uh, we do very well for employability. Our, all of our graduates uh, do very well. I'll show you some graduate statistics in a moment. But generally, also, our graduates earn a premium compared to those from other institutions. And we are very highly cited. You know, people take notice of the work we do, and they use it in their own work. And then they, when they when they publish their work, they cite us. So again, all these very good uh, reasons, and it gives us a very good standing in the academic community. Just to note that both the clinical and public health nutrition and the uh, eating schools and clinical nutrition are accredited by the Association for Nutrition, and of course, dietetics is accredited by the HCPC and BDA. So. We let our, when our students go off uh, and they graduate from us and they go into work in the world, we collect data. And so here we have some data. Um, and it takes a couple of years before we really get all the information back. But what you can see here is actually that our graduates, when they go out there, um, are doing very well. And you can see that 95% you know, of us, of our graduates, are employed at a graduate level or still doing further work. Um, a lot of our students like to go and do PhDs afterwards. They get infused by the research uh, community and the research bug, and they want to go and do some more of it. Uh, we also look where our graduates go, and it, again, you can see most of them are still working in the sort of healthcare area, or at least the healthcare research area. Um, most of them doing highly skilled work or very, very highly skilled research um, to continue their academic career. So why, why study clinical and public health nutrition? For those of you interested in this course particularly, I'll show, I'll cover some general things about the course. Um, that would be of interest to everybody else, but we'll focus a little bit on clinical and public health for the moment. So the first thing is that this is you know, a very good program for an overview of clinical nutrition and also public health nutrition. We look at what's important all the way through the life cycle, right? And we consider what happens in health, what happens in disease, and how malnutrition has a massive impact on the health of our community. There's lots of different reasons on why these things occur. We take a you know a very in-depth look at a lot of them. And, you know, these are things that have got global impact. So it's not just, you know, what's happening in developing countries, but it happens in, you know, first world countries and in, every, in pretty much every country around the world. And we give some consideration to this. And I would say that, you know, the community of researchers that are teaching on our programs, our clinical colleagues and the research colleagues that we bring in to do our teaching are all world leading. You know, they are, we have got a reputation for being world leaders in nutrition, obesity, child health, epidemiology, psychology of disordered eating. And all of these people, some of our co my colleagues who we'll talk to you today, again, uh, acknowledge world experts in these fields. And we bring in lots more people besides. One thing to say, not a food science course. So if you want to know about, you know, tastier breakfast cereal, nicer sandwiches, that type of thing, there are, lo there are lots and lots of excellent programs out there, but this is not one of those. This is about the science of nutrition, what happens in the body and how improving your nutrition can make a massive dif uh, difference in your life. So why nutrition at all? That might be a question that you've considered. Everyone's got to eat because that means everybody an expert on the subject and everyone's got an opinion. Unfortunately, most of those opinions are not correct. But it is true to say that what you eat will have a greater impact on you and on your health than anything else you do. What your diet means is that the impact it has on you affects how you grow, how you develop, whether or not you're going to become sick, and quite often your lifespan. You know, when we think about um, the impact it has on our body, and also you, know, you may be aware of uh, the size of epigenetics, which is how your genes are expressed and how that you know, impacts on the way that your health develops. Well, the thing that has the greatest impact on the way that your genes are expressed in your body is your diet. So there's a direct relationship between what you eat and your long-term health. And undernutrition, overnutrition, malnutrition, all of these are associated with premature mortality and of course, long-term morbidity and illness. So we have got a really, really long track record in this subject. Of course, it's not going very well on top of the slide, but this is um, Sir Jack Drummond. So Jack, Sir Jack Drummond was way back 
in the 1930s, a renowned scientist. And he was uh, particularly famous for uh, developing how to synthesize vitamin A. It's a massive thing at the time. However, his role in the UK became so much more than this because uh, he was one of the sort of few practicing expert nutrition, nutrition experts at the time. And of course, then when the Second World War broke out, broke out, the government needed to know how to keep the UK population healthy. And so they came to UCL, they came to Jack Drummond and his team, and he then devised the ration. So this was the allocation for people in the UK, what they could have every week to eat. And if you look at this now, you might think that's not great. That's not a healthy diet. You know, there's butter, cheese, bacon, all these types of things on there. And we consider that to be healthy. And if you sit down and eat that one meal, it wouldn't be. That's, that's fair to say. However, if you take this diet and you spread this out over a week and you supplement it with unlimited amounts of fruit and vegetables, it actually does become very healthy. And at that time, uh, the UK became you know, incredibly healthy and has not been as healthy since. If we could return people to a ration system, it wouldn't be very popular, but it would probably make the whole country a lot healthier. Now, the problem is we have to look at malnutrition. Now, what do we mean by malnutrition? Well, malnutrition just means wrong nutrition. And we consider overnutrition, undernutrition, all forms of malnutrition, and they all have quite significant consequences. They have consequences both to people's health, but they also have consequences to the country as a whole and the costs of our health system. So what we can see at the moment is that you know, about two thirds of the UK population are overweight or obese, and the prevalence has been steadily increasing. So out of every hundred adults in England, you can see as we work way along here, you know, there is quite a lot of people. There's not that actually proportionately that many people who exist at a healthy weight. And that has got lots of problems and it causes issues for the health service and people are storing up long-term health conditions. It's not just in adults. We can also look at what's happening in children as well. And you know, this was um, data from about two or three years ago. And again, it was showing already that 20% of children were overweight or obese. And, and also when you look at the 10, 11 year olds, again, you see a pattern there, which progresses through into adulthood. And again, children who have uh, issues with being uh, living with being overweight or obese in childhood quite often then carry through health conditions into their adulthood it makes a massive difference because obesity is now costing us in excess of 27 billion pounds every year it's direct costs there's an awful lot of knock-on costs as well from this uh nhs back in almost 10 years ago was spent 6.1 billion it's probably double that now and this is just things like over-the-counter prescriptions for diabetes and we spend more money on diabetes than we do on the police, the fire system, and the judicial system combined. That's a staggering amount of money that we spend every year on this. So diabetes is something we spoke, speak a lot about in the course. We bring in a lot of different aspects to look at this. Um, and it is a bit confusing um, because it's not a, an absolutely linear relationship that once you get to a certain level of being overweight or obese you automatically get diabetes some people do some people don't genetic factors environmental factors a lot of dietary factors all these things going on but one of the things we can say is it is progressing so there were uh, annual updates up to 2015 and now to 2025 and you can see that it's still carrying on and projected to carry on right the way through for the next decade or so so that's some of the stuff we look at the course, we look at the quality of uh, nutrition, we look at what happens, how this influences the body, uh, how this affects your metabolism and your activity levels and your chance of getting disease and your chance of uh, living to a ripe old age. But we also you know, engage in some practical elements as well. So here you can see it's just a few pictures of our students. Um, this one on the left is students visiting hospitals and trying out hospital catering in different forms. Uh, these little pots actually they're trying here are fortified foods. So if you just come out of surgery, and you need you know, uh, foods to enhance your recovery, those are sort of supplemented foods to help build people up quicker. Uh, we have lots of stuff where students get involved and they sort of do test measurements to understand what body composition is. And so once you can measure something, you can assess it appropriately. And there's a number of those students here engaging in ways that we measure energy expenditure and body composition. So the benefits of the degree, well, the benefits of the, all our degrees is you get a thorough grounding in nutrition, nutrition and the way it relates to personal diet lifestyle and modern patterns of disease this is these are core elements and core modules that run right the way through all of our programs 
we have a holistic approach. That means a really you know, 360 degree view of obesity and malnutrition in the modern world. And we look at this both from the metabolic level right the way up to what's happening in society. We equip our students with key skills and core knowledge. That means that they can go out and they can do whatever career they want to do, whether that's engaging with healthcare scientists, working in clinical environments, um, or whether they're going to work in the community, whether they're working with journalists, whether they're working in companies, the, the skills and things that we want our students to develop are essential for integrating themselves into any environment after they graduate. And I'll come back to the fact that we are world leaders in this area. We have a huge variety of expert teaching, lots of clinical colleagues that we bring in from our partner hospitals, as well as people from the community, people from industry, lots of those that we bring in to give one-off specialist lectures on their you know, expertise. Just a quick look at what happens in the course. We predominantly work our course. So this applies to clinical public health nutrition, um, eating disorders, clinical nutrition, and obesity and clinical nutrition. Dietetic is a little bit different, part, and I'm sure that Dr. Pato will talk about this. But the way we work it is in term one, we will teach on a Wednesday. Uh, this is the, the run up to Christmas, this term we're in now. Um, all of the students will do fundamentals. Uh, which is the introductory module where we look at the, the biochemistry and the metabolism. And then in the second half, uh, students on obesity and clinical nutrition and clinical public health nutrition will do disease-related malnutrition and eating disorder students do a clinical science course. On Fridays, everybody does research methods and practical nutrition assessment all the way through the first term. In the second term, that's the one that was January up to Easter, uh, all the students do therapeutic aspects of nutrition on a Wednesday, and then the second half of term, clinical and public health will do uh, nutrition, public health, eating disorders, students do eating disorders, and the obesity ones, as you can see at the bottom, uh, will do obesity and public health, obesity and weight management, and we'll do malnutrition in the community and disease and disorder eating, for clinical and public health, uh, and eating disorder students throughout that term. So we teach on two days, um, which does mean that there's three other days for you know, some students who still maintain part time jobs or at least you know, just do all their study. Once we get to Easter, everybody does dissertation and we offer a, a huge variety of dissertations. We have done dissertations of students going all over the world, uh, all over London. We have students working uh, within our research teams. They work in our laboratories. They work in our part our hospitals. In fact, I don't think you know, we, we've had a student come in with a particular idea that we haven't been able to accommodate in some way. Uh, and bearing in mind, you know, these programs will take Excess of 100 students every year. So we're offering you know, well in excess of 100 projects every year. And a lot of our students work in our partner hospitals. I mentioned them earlier on. I just got some of them on the screen here. Um, UCLH, again, is a massive teaching hospital in central London near Euston Station. The Royal Free is another large teaching hospital in Hampstead. Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children, which is there, again, one of our specialist centres. Uh, and just one of the others, the Eastman Denver Hospital, which is located very close by to UCL. And they do you know, lots of sort of specialist work there. How do we teach? Well, we do an awful lot of uh, different teaching approaches. We have flipped work, uh, a lot of online sessions. We do problem-based learning, workshops, peer instruction, a lot of case studies are involved in what we, how we teach. Uh, we do this coursework involved in every module, but there are exams as well. The research project's a major uh, factor of the course and all these other things that we're talking about. And of course, we do have quite a lot of lectures. Right, so I'm going to stop there because I think my time's up and I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Papado, I believe, next. So I'll stop sharing my screen and Thank we'll come back later on if anyone's got any questions. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining our open day today. Uh, it is our pleasure uh, to talk to you about our MSC Dietetics pre registration uh, program. Uh, my name is uh, Evstathia Papada, and I'm a registered dietitian and a lecturer in nutrition at the Division of Medicine, and I'm also one of the program co leads for the MSC Dietetics. So before I present an overview of our program, 
I would like to first explain briefly what dietetics is, what do dietitians do, and uh, areas they're involved in. So according to the British Dietetic Association, dietetics is the science around how nutrition affects our health. And it seems that its importance is increasing during the last decades. Uh, there is plenty of evidence showing that our diet is linked with the risk for developing non-communicable diseases that have an increasing uh, burden on public health, uh, such as diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular diseases. But dietetics is not only limited uh, to on the prevention and management of these diseases, as it can also play a significant role in the management of clinical conditions such as gastrointestinal diseases, liver, renal diseases, and, and many more. So these are only some of the reasons why dietitians are uh, crucial members of uh, the healthcare professionals uh, community. And according to the British Dietetic Association, uh, they are qualified and regulated health professionals that assess, diagnose, and treat dietary and nutritional problems at an individual or a wide public health level. Uh, also, it is important to mention that the title dietitian is the only food and nutrition title that is protected by law, and only those registered with a statutory regulator, the Health and Care Professional Council, can use the title. So let's see a little bit what do dietitians do. So they interpret the, the science of nutrition to improve health and treat diseases uh, or conditions by educating and giving practical, personalized advice to clients, patients, carers, and colleagues. They also advise and help to maintain nutritional status uh, when individuals want to trial dietary interventions such as exclusion diets, nutritional supplementation, or dietary interventions. They use recognized methodologies to create to critically appraise the evidence base, which includes all forms of evidence and research to inform their advice. It is also very important to highlight the different areas uh, where dietitians can work, because often we think that uh, dietitians can only work in clinical environments such as hospitals. This is obviously a career option that a big percentage of dietitians may choose, but it is not the only pathway, as they can also work in private practice, in food industry, in media and communications, in research, in academia, in case they choose the academic pathway, in the sports sector, in charities, and of course, in public health. And upon designing our program, we have ensured that we are preparing our students for these various emerging roles they can work in. So why study dietetics at UCL? Uh, our course is developed in a way that uh, will equip you to become a competent, passionate, and autonomous dietitian. Uh, you will be able to deliver evidence-based service user-centered dietetic care and innovative public health nutrition initiatives across a range of client groups and working environments. And you will also uh, gain the confidence, knowledge, and skills uh, to translate complex scientific evidence about food, health, disease, and human behavior in order to assess, diagnose, and treat nutrition-related problems in individuals and improve the health of the populations. Uh, our program is structured around both academic and practice placement learning, which are very strongly combined in order to provide students with the academic knowledge and also the practical experience that they will need to work in a wide range of settings. Students will study key concepts relevant to nutrition and dietetic theory and practice both in health and pathological conditions. And another important part of the course are the professional skills that dietitians need to develop, including reflective practice and ethical considerations. Let's see now in more detail, what does the course cover? Uh, so students will acquire knowledge upon nutrition and metabolism in health and disease and across the different life stages. They will learn about research methods in nutrition and also nutritional assessment. We will cover topics of clinical practice in three different modules as well as professional practice and communication skills, which are a crucial aspect of the professional skills required for dietitians. 
And uh, one of the favorite aspects of the program is uh, that students have the opportunity to experiment in our brand new state-of-the-art teaching kitchen on modifying the nutritional content of the recipe, the texture of food, and also to experiment on different specialized diets that accommodate the needs of specific patient populations. Uh, here you can see some recipes prepared by our students. Uh, so let's see a little bit how the program looks like. So in year one, here you can see in black the shared modules with the other nutrition MSc programs, and in dark pink, you can see the bespoke module for the dietetic students. So in term one, um, you will uh, uh, join uh, the other nutrition MSc uh, students. Uh, and these modules are the fundamentals of nutrition and metabolism, practical nutritional assessment and research methods. And also we will start talking about professional practice in dietetics. Professionalism is a concept that we will introduce early in the course because this is a very important aspect that you will need to develop uh, before you join your uh, placements and also, and also before you uh, go into the dietetic workforce. And also uh, at the end of term one, uh, you will uh, get your first experience in placement one. Uh, in term two, um, you will uh, join some shared modules, uh, which are the therapeutic aspects of nutrition and malnutrition in the community. And uh, we will continue the module Professional Practice and Dietetics 1, and you will have uh, another module um, called Lifestyle Management Prevention in the Food Environment, or Clinical Practice 1, as we call it. In term three, it will be your uh, it will be the time for the next placement, placement two way in a clinical setting, uh, which is part time, and I will uh, tell you more uh, in the next slides. Uh, and also we will have some uh, simulations on campus, and we will continue also with the module professional practice in dietetics one on Fridays with reflections on uh, placement two way experience. And here is how year two looks like. So in term one, uh, we will continue with the module professional practice in dietetics two, where we will discuss uh, more advanced topics of professionalism. Um, you will uh, then go into your next placement, placement 2B, which is again part-time. And uh, then um, towards uh, the middle of uh, this term, uh, we have the module clinical practice three or advanced dietetic practice. In term two, it's the time for uh, your final full-time placement in a clinical setting. Uh, and then in term three, it will be the time to work on your research project, um, which uh, you will uh, be submitting by uh, the end of August. And uh, I will now move on to a um, brief overview of our placements. And uh, we have managed to uh, set up four different placements within this two-year program. And uh, one uh, very important aspect that we introduced in uh, those placements is the non-clinical placement, uh, which uh, we think that will prepare the students uh, for the various roles that um, they can work in after graduation. So here you can see an overview of the placement. So placement one is equivalent to 10 days. It is um, delivered uh, three days per week for three weeks at university with a combination of uh, simulation, case studies and peer discussion. And also uh, the students have the opportunity to attend a day within a traditional NHS setting and also uh, spend half a day with the nutrition support team uh, And, and I think observing the world round and uh, multidisciplinary team making. So it is the first exposure to the clinical environment. 
placement 2A is equivalent to 50 days, and we spend three days of the initial week at university with simulations and case studies. And then students go to uh, traditional NHS settings for uh, 12 weeks uh, and 40 days in total. Um, this is a part-time placement. Um, students attend the NHS settings for three days per week. And we continue working on the um, uh, skills um, that you will need to develop uh, one day per week using simulations or a satellite outpatient clinic with a combination of uh, joint uh, and uh, in the, or individual uh, and peer support. Uh, placement 2B is uh, taking place at the start of year two, and this is a unique element of our program since uh, we're, we try to uh, secure uh, different placement settings, um, non-clinical settings, uh, so that the students uh, can appreciate the different roles that um, a dietetics uh, career uh, may involve. So uh, in the previous years, we have worked with uh, industry, with freelancers, with uh, medtech companies, with charities. So the students uh, spend 20 days at the start of term one, part-time, three days per week in these non-traditional settings. And then placement three is the final one. It is equivalent to 60 days. It takes place uh, full-time, five days per week within an NHS setting. And in this way, we are uh, covering more than 1,000 hours of practice placement learning as stipulated by the British Dietetic Association. And last but not least, our program is fully compliant with the latest British Dietetic Association curriculum guidance, which reflects the role of dietitians now and into the future. And uh, by the successful completion of this course, you will be eligible to apply to the Health and Care Professions uh, Council for registration as dietitian um, by the end of this uh, course. So. Thank you very much uh, for listening, and um, I will have sharing now. Thank you, Dr. Papada. It's now over to uh, Dr. Kalea, please. Give me one minute to share. In the meantime, I remind all of you to add your question in the Q&A session, please. Let me know when you see the screen. Is sharing now. Thank you. Okay. Can you see me as well? All fine. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Okay, so next I will talk to you about uh, the MSc in Obesity and Clinical Nutrition. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Anastasia Kalea, and I'm an Associate Professor in Teaching and the Academic Program Director for this MSc. Um, and we designed a full MSc program, a full postgraduate program about obesity as it is a disease that um, affects a lot of people. It's around uh, 1.25 million people living with obesity and overweight in the UK. Um, and um, uh, over half of the adults in the UK are um, living with, um, with uh, complications and, and this uh, obesity as a disease. So understanding diet, nutrition, and its wider impact on health is essential. And what our program offers is specialized training in the clinical and scientific basis of overnutrition and obesity. And we also uh, discuss about public health measures and therapeutic approaches. Um, uh, so we'll look both at prevention and treatment. 
and um, no other university is able to offer such a wide range of high caliber partners and experts in this area, both scientific and clinical um, in the field of obesity. So our students have the opportunity to be involved with some of these partners and that's the UCLH Bariatric Center for Weight Management and Metabolic Cent uh, Surgery, <clears throat> the NAHR Obesity Policy Research Unit, the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare. So um, many different um, uh, scientists uh, that do work in different directions in the area of obesity. Um, one important barrier that currently impedes optimal care delivery to patients living with obesity is weight bias and stigma. And therefore our program has been developed to teach future healthcare professionals about that um, unrecognized transmission of attitudes and beliefs relevant to patient care. Uh, so we do have lots of teachings embedded, but lots of uh, experiential learning around professional values and clinical training, but also um, uh, our goal is to change the narrative around obesity and the way we perceive uh, that kind of uh, clinical condition. Therefore, um, uh, you will be exposed to that kind of training. And we do believe that this affects the quality of clinical management of this uh, chronic disease. And our goal is to train uh, healthcare professionals um, in this. Um, obesity, I don't need to show you too many facts to convince you that um, obesity trends are, uh, are going really, um, have tripled since the 70s. Um, it affects lots of people living in this country, but also worldwide with the disease and its complications. And most of the world's population uh, live in countries where overweight and obesity kills more people than underweight. So we do focus lots about the um, the reasons for this uh, high prevalence, uh, the trend data, the epidemiological evidence linking obesity with a range of physical and uh, uh, psychosocial health conditions. Um, obesity is considered a public health crisis that impairs the health and quality of life of people. And um, it adds, uh, as you can imagine, considerably to national health care budgets. Uh, it does affect though, the quality of life of people. And this is something we emphasize quite a lot. And uh, preventing obesity is urgently required to reverse current trends. <clears throat> um, it seems to affect, as you see here, uh, a publication from the World Obesity around 1.9 billion adults um, around the world, 650 million are living with obesity. It does affect both, both men and women. In this country, nearly two thirds of adults uh, are uh, living with overweight or living with obesity. And uh, this is, as we define obesity and overweight based on BMI cutoffs for populations. And um, in uh, England, the proportion of people that um, uh, are living with obesity has increased from 30.2% in men to 269 uh, within um, uh, a couple of decades. So from um, early 90s to 2015-2016. Um, the rate of increase has slowed down since 2001, although the trend is still upwards. And um, the prevalent interest in the prevalence of obesity, as you see here in the graph, is similar among men, men and women, but men are more likely to live with overweight. And the evidence is overwhelming on the association of increased adiposity um, and complications such as insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea arthritis, um, gallbladder disease, and certainly uh, a variety of types of cancer, all of these comorbidities associated with that um, uh, increased adiposity. So this is something that we look through the course, we go through the evidence base around um, the associations between uh, increased adiposity and how, uh, how that leads to disease. And this image here is from a report produced by the UK government's foresight program on tackling obesity. Um, this report develops scenarios of the future to explore how the UK could respond to rising levels of obesity. And it's called the Obesity Systems Map. Uh, and it's sometimes derided for its complexity because it shows that 
what is really key in this uh, area that it has been instrumental in creating a far more balanced perspective about the roles of the individual and the environment. Um, more specifically, it shows that the independent contributions of a poor diet and physical inactivity as drivers of excess weight gain <clears throat> and awareness that some individuals are biologically more susceptible to weight gain. It recognizes that the food environment has a, a significant impact on the personal choices. And um, so uh, it acknowledges all these interactions between the environment and the individual. And this is something we certainly address in our teachings and in our course, especially as we go towards the public health and obesity uh, teachings. Um, so we looked at that whole systems approach. Uh, we looked at uh, policy makers and um, uh, we're trying to, to explain how focusing on a single initiative um, is uh, very restrictive and we need to incorporate that systems thinking into tackling obesity. Our goal is for our graduates to develop, thorough, to develop a thorough grounding in the theory and application of nutrition, both in prevention but also in treatment of obesity and its complications, to develop a good understanding of the causes, the current best practice for treating overweight and obesity, as observed in uh, clinical practice. And by the time uh, the graduates, uh, we want them to be knowledgeable in public health nutrition issues and the strategies employed at both national and local levels. <clears throat> of course, they are exposed to specialist knowledge related to research on obesity and complications through the research projects and the health risks um, uh, involved. Um, and Graduates also will also develop a range of intellectual, academic, practical research skills as part of the course related to the interpretation, but also the evaluation of academic literature. But most importantly, students not only will learn the latest evidence based on the treatment of obesity, but also they will be exposed to state of the art research in the area, new technologies, real life treatment of this disease through clinical visits, but also th through interactions with uh, patients. And our program follows that tier one to tier four um, approach in tier one, which is that the, these are the four tiers of UK weight of weight management in the UK. So we looked at universal interventions. We looked at lifestyle interventions, specialist services, but also uh, surgery. So we looked at um, uh, different ways to manage obesity based on, um, and its complications, of course, based on uh, the risk. Um, and the assessment that is conducted. And our students um, share some modules with the clinical nutrition and public health programs. Students uh, overall undertake modules to the value of 180 credits. Um, the program consists of eight compulsory modules. This will give 120 credits and one dissertation that will contribute towards 60 credits. <clears throat> there are no elective or optional modules. And um, there will be um, during term one, um, uh, they will join the clinical nutrition public health students uh, to go through the fundamentals of nutrition and metabolism. And uh, we will start with disease related malnutrition to try to understand the link between inflammation, obesity, and uh, comorbidities and metabolic health. And they will also follow uh, teachings on Fridays on research methods and uh, nutritional assessment. And then in term two, the two um, modules highlighted in purple here, um, they, uh, they're bespoke uh, uh, modules for the obesity and clinical nutrition students who will look closely at obesity and weight management, uh, but also at obesity and public health. And at the same time in term two, there will be teaching some therapeutic aspects of nutrition and on disease and disordered eating. And as Professor Davis explained from um, April to August students focus on the research projects and part-time students will be able to attend four modules each year um, and the research project is conducted in year two. Now it's not, um, our clinical visits are not um, mandatory for this course, uh, but we do offer the opportunity of clinical observations during term two um, and to attend online patient clinics with dietitians or in bariatric surgery. And that uh, uh, is followed by a Q&A session <clears throat> with key staff members at UCLH. 
uh, which is uh, an, an exciting opportunity for our students. And the other exciting part is the involvement in uh, research projects, um, not only in definitely in obesity, but also in uh, um, comorbidities, in interacting with patient groups that um, um, and interesting research projects that take place um, every year. Um, and there's a great variety of them. Now, as I said, uh, quite a lot of us at UCL uh, that are teaching on the course are very uh, sensitive about reducing weight stigma in healthcare in order to improve um, practice. And uh, we have designed our curriculum around this. Uh, here I have an example of a research project uh, from a student in clinical nutrition and public health that was um, published and, and um and helped us and put it was a scoping review that could um, that helped us to explore the evidence around um, medical education reducing obesity uh, in uh, educating healthcare professionals. So um, this is an example of a project that led to a change in practice and actually reshaped our curriculum. And this is um, this is something that attracted a lot of interest uh, in the media last summer. And we're very proud to say that we followed uh, that um, um, good practice and the, the evidence-based research to shape this MC program. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions in the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaleo. And now is over to uh, Professor Paul Robinson and Dr. Erika Cini. Thank you. All right. So uh, I can see you've you've shared your screen, Erica. That's great. So uh, when I uh, when I say next slide, you can move on to the next slide if that's okay. Okay. So move on a bit. Keep going. Yes. Okay. So I'm uh, I'm Paul Robinson. Um, I'm a, a professor at UCL. And um, in um, uh, 2012, I, oh, it's gone. Is that right? What's happened? Oh, it's back again. Good. Um, I started the MSc in uh, Eating Disorders and Clinical Nutrition. Um, I'm a um, psychiatrist and um, I was concerned and I'm, I work in eating disorders. And I was worried that um, we really didn't um, um, have um, a course which taught people about nutrition and eating disorders at master's level. Uh, and so I came to, um, to UCL and uh, I spoke to Professor George Grimble and Professor Alistair Forbes, who were both uh, leading the uh, clinical and public health nutrition course at the time. And um, they welcomed me and uh, and and helped me uh, start this start this course. We had two two uh, students in our first first uh, year, uh, and that rapidly increased. So now we have sort of between thirty five and thirty eight students a year. That's probably the most we can manage. Um, perhaps a little bit less, in fact. Um, so. First of all, something about eating disorders, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with them, um, they're, they're very common um, uh, mental health disorders. Uh, they're um, the most common um, uh, chronic disorders in, uh, in young women. Um, uh, they're affecting um, up to 10% of uh, people. Um, uh, and and they, they comprise anorexia nervosa, um, with which can be very severely underweight, and bulimia nervosa with binging and vomiting and laxative abuse, and binge eating disorder um, with um, binging, uh, often associated with um, uh, obesity, uh, and ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is um, a limited uh, sort of food restriction, uh, not to, not to do with um, fear of fatness, but more to do with problems with um, uh, texture and colour of food and, and is frequently associated with autism. So these, all, these, all these conditions and uh, the um, atypical forms of them 
uh, are very common in society. Um, um, as I said, up to 10%. Um, and also that they have, um, mostly anorexia nervosa has a, a very high death rate. Um, it's um, six times the uh, what you would expect uh, for the age of the of the people um, having it. So we're talking we're, to we're talking about some really lethal conditions. Um, so um, starting this degree, it's the only similar degree worldwide, and so we do get um, students from all over the world. I started it in two thousand and twelve. Uh, we share six modules with uh, clinical and public health nutrition, and there are two eating disorder mod modules, which I'll, I'll tell you about on the next slide, um, and dissertation of, uh, of 10,000 words, 10 to 12,000 words, on an eating disorder subject. So overall, the eating disorder element of this course is about 50% of the, of the entire course. So it's quite heavily eating disorder. And um, as um, Nathan uh, uh, Davis told you, a su successful graduates can apply for registered associate nutrition status with the Association for Nutrition. Uh, the people who come to us uh, are mostly graduates of medicine, psychology, nutrition, and dietetics. But we've had um, other people uh, from from various um, backgrounds, including uh, uh, non scientific backgrounds like English, town planning. Um, they um, sometimes have um, particular challenges, but um, if they've had uh, um, experience in the field, uh, then we consider them. And uh, as Nathan was also telling you, the, the students uh, doing our course go on to um, do, um, to have very, very good careers. Um, they've we've had some people going on to study medicine. Um, they often go on to dietetics, sometimes uh, at UCL, as we now have a dietetics course. They've entered PhD programs, and they've obtained jobs in eating disorder services and uh, research programs. And as well as the MSc, there are also um, a, a postgraduate diploma. Um, uh, which is the same as the MSc, but without the research project, and a postgraduate certificate, which is four of the modules of the um, uh, MSc program, but without and without the um, uh, uh, research project. And also, you can take the, the degree part or full time, so you can do it over one year, which is two days a week, or two years, which is one day a week. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, just to go through uh, very quickly the, the different modules. Um, what I wanted uh, originally was to uh, provide a course which gave um, uh, a nutrition basis. Uh, and we, we, as you see, with fundamentals, with disease and disordered eating, with therapeutic aspects, with nutrition assessment, with malnutrition in the community, and the experimental design, we give a very good basis uh, in um, clinical nutrition. But I also wanted quite a bit of um, uh, eating disorders. And so we have a module which is called Eating Disorders of Clinical Science, um, which is the basic um, science of eating disorders, the etiology, the epidemiology, the clinical features, mostly. Um, and and in fact, the, the eating disorder treatment has now been um, renamed the Eating Disorders Management and Treatment, which uh, Dr. Cheney will be talking about. And that, as you can imagine, is, is um, heavily um, influenced by uh, the, the, very, the, the diverse treatments available for eating disorders. And then there's the research project. Um, like in the other um, MSCs, we have a, a wide range of, of projects that uh, students have done. Um, from um, uh, collecting new data to using existing data um, supplied by different researchers uh, to doing um, uh, systematic reviews and uh, also meta-analysis. So, um, and, and uh, the the other thing that pe people have done which is not successfully is um, uh, is um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, looking at clinical services and, and clinical service evaluation. But uh, Dr. Cheney will, will talk more about those. Just to say that um, 
we've had several papers published by students. Um, um, for example, one on um, uh, waiting times, uh, which was um, published in uh, the European Eating Disorders Review, and another one on uh, physical monitoring in anorexia nervosa, which was also in the um, eating, uh, European eating, eating Disorders Review. And um, that had quite an impact and um, is, um, is quoted in um, national documents. Okay, the next. Okay, so um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the treatment and management module, which Dr. Cheney will uh, talk about. Okay, so if you'd like to take over. Yes, sure. Um, so yeah, so following nicely on from the clinical skills module, which is delivered in term one, in term two, we will be um, mastering more around our knowledge on eating disorders by focusing on the clinical aspects then. So from assessment all the way to diagnosis and management across all of the lifespan. So we'll be focusing on young mm -hmm. children, focusing on adolescents, and we'll be focusing on adults and old age and how the symptoms evolve. Here are a number of the learning objectives from this module. So it's thinking about being able to identify and describe the eating disorder symptomatology across genders, across um, ethnicities, and in different parts of the world, being able to explain what an eating disorder assessment involves and being able to understand how this is conducted. We'll be thinking about the different therapeutic modalities across the age span and how this links in with the evidence base and how these are then informed by informed by NICE and other national standards and guidances. As we know, one of the things is what are you going to be doing after this course? As uh, Professor Robinson mentioned, one of the aspects is being involved clinically um, in different roles within either multidisciplinary or multi-agency. And one of the aspects to help you get a better understanding of the clinical roles is we organize a three-day observational clinical placement so that you can get to see what's done on the ground, you can get to speak to different professionals to help think about the next steps in your career if you decide to go down a clinical route and not an academic route, which is the other option in, in an MSc, following on from an MSc. And finally, in this module, you'll also get to appraise the pros and cons of different therapeutic settings so that you'll be able to understand when should, where should the patient be treated. And we have different types of treatment modalities within the community in the UK, from outpatient models where they're seen once or twice a week, to intensive community outpatient programs where they're seen about four to six times a week, all the way up to day treatment programs where the patient spends the whole day there and then goes to sleep at home to inpatient setting. And you'll be able to evaluate and ascertain when would be most suitable depending on on their severity. Another attachment to this module is we run a module, uh, sorry, a course on managing emergencies and eating disorders, which is a one day course which people on our master's program will also be invited to join. The last module in terms of the three eating disorder specific modules, as Professor Robinson said, is the dissertation module. And ultimately, this is also to help you give that breadth of research skills put into practice in an area which you're interested in. And as Professor Robinson said, we offer a range of different types of work that can be done. And a number of those have been presented at various national and international conferences. And some have even gone on to um, full length article publication. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think this is the end of our presentation. Yes, you're right, it is. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we're happy to to now start the Q&A. Uh, many questions have 
been already asked and answered and I can see one question in our one question in our um inbox that I will read out to you all uh, and you're free to to take turns in uh, in answering so uh, can you serve in the NHS as a nutritionist dietitian during your master's if you are an international student with a bachelor's degree in nutrition and dietetics? Uh, I'm well, I'm part way through typing the answer to that one. Um, no, okay. it's a simple answer. Um, you have to be an accre UK accredited and you can only become UK accredited once you have undertaken an accredited program uh, within the UK. So unfortunately not. It's, uh, it potentially is possible if you have completed a dietetics course overseas, that you can go through the accreditation procedure and the UK HCPC does recognize a number of overseas qualifications. Um, I would say it's not a straightforward process, but it is possible. Thank you, Nathan. I had many questions that, as I said, have been answered, but I would I would read out some for the benefit of all the attendees while we get more questions um, in our in our uh, box. Actually, many questions are coming in. So. <laughs> How to interpret the difference between a clinical nutritionist and a dietitian? Uh, shall I start and then perhaps hand over to uh, Effie and Natasha? So, um, within the UK, the uh, dietitian is a protected title. Uh, and so, uh, in order to work as a dietitian, you have to be accredited as a dietitian by HCPC, uh, and they set a number of um, sort of very clear um, core values that you have to demonstrate that you have achieved. Um, and so only people who have achieved these qualifications can work as a dietitian. Um, nutritionist is not a protected title. There is a professional register. And again, our courses are assigned up to the professional register. So our graduates can apply and become, you know, uh, eventually become professionally registered themselves. Uh, working with NHS, there's um, there are roles for nutritionists. Uh, these these tend to be more um, public health facing, and it tends to be more about keeping people healthy rather than dealing with the sick. It's more that dietitians work with people who are ill, who've got di diagnosed existing conditions. Nutritionists tend to work to keep people healthy. Although that's a very broad simplification. Um, I don't know anyone else to add to that. Thank you, Nathan. Very clear. And one more question. I graduated in sports science. Can I apply for dietetics? Or I have to take some subject before I apply to it? Anyone want to take this question? If you still mute. Yeah. So, 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 I'll start with you sort of your, your sound. Um, you can apply. Um, yes, it will sort of depend a little bit on the um, on the courses that you covered as part of your sports science degree. Um, if you had um, a large component of uh, nutrition and metabolism in there, you will probably be okay. Uh, but we just need to um, perhaps you know, get in touch with us after this and we can have a look at the transcript and give you some sort of more advice. Absolutely. Okay. Dr. Kalea, would you like to add anything to it? No, if not, I will go. Does it mean that the dietetics program will include a hospital internship even for the international students? Yes. The placements are the same for all of the students. So all of the students, in order to be able to uh, graduate, they have to successfully complete uh, the four different placements. 
Thank um, you. I noticed uh, Sophie Sophie's question. Do you, do, I don't know if it was answered about um, uh, uh, whether she can work in um, as a, a, as a as a registered nutritionist after doing the eating disorders and clinical nutrition degree. Do, shall I um, shall I say something about that? Yes, please. Okay. Well. Um, getting the um, after you qualify with the MSc in eating disorders and clinical nutrition, you can uh, you can work as a um, as um, a um, an eating disorders associate or a psychology assistant um, in an eating disorder service um, uh, without any further qualifications. Uh, if you do that for a year, then uh, you can apply for um, um, full, full uh, associate membership of the. Association for Nutrition, and then you can work as an uh, as a nutritionist. Um, however, um, and then, but after that, um, uh, I think the most uh, useful thing would be to do a dietetics course, become a, a dietitian, and then you can work in uh, clinical settings such as the, the NHS, in hospital, or in an eating disorder service, or in the private sector. So yes, the answer is yes. You can you can start working right away, uh, but you do need to, to work independently with um, uh, with patients with eating disorders. Uh, you need further uh, qualifications, namely the dietetics is the most common one to do. Thank you. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you. Um, there is one more question that has been answered. Um, now, but I will read out for for everyone. Is there a hospital internship included in the MSc program in eating disorder and clinical nutrition? Could could Erica um, address this one? Erica is typing an answer right now. Um, but if we if we can also tell everyone, Erica would be great. Um, so, so we don't have an internship. What we have is a three-day observational placement, and this can be in either a child setting, um, or in outpatients, which is a community setting, or in an inpatient, so a hospital setting, or also in adults. And in adults, we have uh, the same. We have a day program, we have outpatients, and we have hospital. Um, it's just a taster. However, what ha what we have seen is that quite. A few of our MSc students have successfully been able to get on and been successful in being recruited um, by a number of the placements uh, in one of the roles that um, Professor Robinson mentioned earlier. Thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed that there were a few questions about admissions. Um, so I've uh, added in the chat for everyone the um, link for um, admissions inquiries. Any other question? Please feel free to add in our Q&A inbox. We have another five minutes to can answer I your question. About, um, Emiliana, can I say something about admissions? Absolutely, yes. Uh, just a bit of advice for anyone applying for our course. Uh, do mention that you're interested in eating disorders um, because we have uh, quite a few uh, applications where they don't mention eating disorders anywhere in their application. Um, and sometimes they arrive and they don't know what an eating disorder is. So um, please don't do that. Uh, please mention eating disorders. Disorders, find out what an eating disorder is so that you know what you're in for. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for clarifying. And we do have another couple of... Uh, Erica, you want to add? Yes, please. I was going to answer the next... Um, volunteer to answer the next question. So will UCL play a part to the nutrition-related policy-making processes in Parliament? Um, I'll let Nathan and Natasha answer the nutrition aspect, but what I wanted to add is we do are we are involved in national policy making in terms of eating disorders. So Professor Robinson led on the MEAD guidance, and I'm on the board, the national board for the access and waiting times 
standards for children and adolescents with eating disorders. And with that, sometimes there are independent projects to inform these um, larger national work that we sometimes invite students to join and be part of. So I had a student who did a scoping review, which then informed one of the chapters of the access and waiting time standards, et cetera. So there are lots of opportunities out there. Ah, so what I would say to add to that is that um, a large number of our academics and um, clinical colleagues are regularly invited to give advice um, to at a, a variety of um, events. Uh, we are quite often leading members in nationally recognized organizations. Dr. Callia, for example, is uh, one of the trustees of the Nutrition Society, which is a sort of uh, one of the more eminent research based um, organizations in the UK, the Advising on Nutrition. Uh, many of us have already been invited to parliamentary committees to participate in discussions and debates and to give information to, uh, to MPs, ministers who are, who are making uh, these decisions. Um, and very an occasion as well, also not just at the government level, but also at local and regional levels. The the work that we do, the stuff we are, uh, the research we undertake, that feeds back and influences local policy, and then local policy and then has an instrumental role to play in sort of national policy. So I would say yes, we do. Um, it's it's quite varies in the way that we do interact with this. Sometimes it's very specific. You know, we get called on to ask uh, answer particular questions. Other times, the work that we're doing sort of generally influences the way that things develop. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, there's a couple of dietetic registration questions there. Perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Pad or Dr. Kelly, will I take those? Yes, so uh, the next I can see is to attain the status of a registered dietitian, not licensed, should we take the colloquium exam? I'm not sure. What is meant here, but just to mention that uh, by the completion of uh, an accredited program like ours, you will be able to um, apply to the HCPC to become a registered dietitian. So there is now no additional exam you need to take if you have completed an, an accredited program in the UK. And then I can see another one. What I mean to ask is, can, uh, can you register yourself in nutritionist that isn't registered during your master's program if you're an international student, like by an exam for D, or it's necessary to complete education in the UK first? I think we have already answered a similar question. So it depends if you have completed an, the didactics program overseas, then you might be eligible to apply to be registered that is in the UK. If not, you need to complete a UK-based program to apply for registration. And the next one, I think, is about eating disorders. Yes, what is the current eating disorder project UCL is undertaking? Um. Well, we've got uh, 35 students at the moment. They're all doing different projects, so it would take a while to talk about them all. But um, um, but could could the could the question be a bit more specific? Is there an area they're interested in? Perhaps you could just give a couple of examples of the the breadth of programs that you're offering this year. Yes, well, we're um, we're doing one pro one. Um, I, can, I can do that. I can most mostly talk about the ones I'm supervising. So um, we're doing um, a study of the microbiome in anorexia nervosa, salivary microbiome, which is proving very interesting. Um, we're doing um, we're doing a um, a qualitative study of online and uh, in person daycare. Um, uh, but I, I don't want to hog the whole thing. Jerick, uh, Erica, do you want to say a little bit more about uh, the, the interesting projects that are on online? Yeah, lots of interesting projects, as you're saying. Some of the ones you've just mentioned, we have a lot on a, um, eating disorders and ASD or eating disorders and ADHD, so different comorbidities and their interface. We have some student choices. We have about intensive outpatient program. We have a few research projects on mentalization. So 
So um, we also have some controversial topics around the use of nasogastric feeding at normal weight in eating disorder patients who are inpatients. So um, there's another controversial topic around palliative care and eating disorders and different different perspectives on that. So quite a breadth of, of topics, which are all very interesting. And it's usually quite hard to choose because you read the next one and it's as interesting as the one before. Um, and there's also a few which are student choices, um, either as systematic reviews or as a project where students might work in an eating disorder service and they want to conduct an audit service evaluation specifically in the, their area. There's a follow-up project question here, which is um, policy making related to eating disorders. I think, um, as we mentioned earlier, Professor Robinson uh, with some with colleagues um, wrote the national guidelines on how to care for patients with anorexia uh, nervosa. And, and this is something that's been rolled out both nationally and also internationally as well as the accepted standard in the, the way that you know these patients should be managed, uh, which I think is a you know fairly significant project that uh, that we're all um, you know, I think very proud of Professor Robinson for for authoring. And the other one that we're currently working on is the access and waiting times revision for children and young people. So it's basically the clinical and waiting guidance about how timely and what the services in the UK should be looking like. So that's due to come out early next year. It's currently in consultation process. Mm. Also, just to say, we're, we're working on a policy for patients admitted to intensive care units, um, which is a very highly specific situation where uh, the, the, the most ill patients who uh, sometimes need uh, intubation and, uh, and ventilation uh, are are brought into intensive care and, and you've got to be very careful about um, sedating someone like that who's got a very low BMI and be very uh, vulnerable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a brilliant session with a lot of questions. Um, we now reach the end of our session, I'm afraid. So I hope we answer your questions. Um, and we will send out the recording of, of this talk. So thank you again, everyone, the speakers and the attendees for being with us today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.